Lord, your word is sustenance for our spirits, and uh, we desire to be filled with you, with your knowledge, with your truth, with your love. Uh, Lord, edify us, strengthen us, bind us together in your, Lord, in your hand tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So tonight we're looking at Psalm chapter 22, or not Psalm chapter 22, excuse me. Tonight we're looking at 2 Samuel chapter 22, but it was a reasonable mistake to call it a psalm because, in fact, this is fair to say, I suppose, a rough draft of Psalms chapter 18, uh, both of which were written by David, this one providing a bit more of the context. It's, it's always wonderful to me when we find a passage that is clearly psalm-like in its structure and in its content in other places within Scripture, because it really helps to contextualize those within the life of the person who was writing them. And uh, in this one, we see David having written this incredible prayer. Now, this is a little bit out of context within 2 Samuel, it's believed that this was written not at this point in time here in in first second Samuel chapter 22 but but really probably closer uh, to the time when David was first established as king in Israel um, this was probably before uh, the rebellion of Absalom this was probably even before David's sin with Bathsheba though we don't know for sure uh, but it was very likely before those things that David speaks this. In verse 1 we read, Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So again, that contextualizes it a bit. God delivered David time and time and time again, both before the writing of these passages and after, right? both from the hand of Saul, but also from the hand of Absalom and others. In fact, um, it's very likely that when David wrote this psalm, he had already been delivered from the hand of Saul and had already gone to war against the Philistines, the Ammonites, the Syrians, the Moabites, and the Edomites. So there was a whole list of enemies that David had had to face in the establishment of his kingdom and in facing off against God's enemies and Israel's enemies in the early days of his reign. And so we read that David spoke to the Lord the words of this song. So what do we call it when we speak something to the Lord, whether it's in song or in spoken word? What do we call that? We call it prayer, right? So this, in essence, is David's prayer to the Lord that later would be written for more common use in Psalm chapter 18. So David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And here's what David said. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The God of my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you have saved me from violence. Amen? In fact, that's not in the past tense, that's in the present tense. He says, you save me from violence. As we look at these first few verses, there's something I, I want you to notice. David is talking about what God is. And he gives us this list of metaphors, each one of which describes a slightly different aspect of how David sees God and that describes in a slightly different way from each of the others his relationship with God. First of all, he calls God his rock. A rock is what? A rock is solid. A rock is strong. A rock is, is hard, and it's not easily moved, right? So he calls God his rock. He calls God his fortress. What is a fortress? A fortress is a place, a dwelling, a, a, a sanctuary, someplace where you can go that you know you are protected, that you are safe inside of a fortress, amen? So he calls God a fortress, he calls the Lord his deliverer. 
Well, that's even more proactive than a fortress, isn't it? A rock or a fortress, they don't necessarily take any action. You simply stand on them or hide in them. And certainly the Lord was something that David could stand upon, and the Lord was someone that David could take refuge in. But to call God his deliverer actually implies action on God's part, not just that David can stand upon his word, not just that David can take refuge in him, but that God had actually taken action action and delivered David. He says that he is my shield and my horn. A shield, of course, we see the uh, the reference in the New Testament, Ephesians 6, of the shield of faith, right, with which we can quench all of the fiery darts of the enemy. Well, a shield is that which protects you, which is right there upon your arm, close by, always at hand. And this suggests not only the nearness of God, but of God's personal protection of David. And then my horn, the word horn, is used to epitomize strength, right? Or power, or authority. And so he's saying, God is my rock, God is my fortress, God is my deliverer, God is my horn, he is my stronghold and my refuge. So again, David is speaking over and over and over again what God is to him, what God has shown him to be. And I love this because it gives us this beautiful example of how we we also should pray, right? It gives us this beautiful example of how we also should pray that, that we begin our prayer by acknowledging the character and the strength and the majesty of God. In other words, we don't necessarily begin with what God has done for us, but we begin with who God is, right? We begin with praise. We begin with adoration. And that's what David has done here. Now in verse 4, he goes on to say, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. How many of y'all recognize those words as being the words of an old song that you probably sang in Sunday school, right? I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Amen? And so we've taken this psalm and made it into a song as well. And and it's a, a beautiful, beautiful song of praise because David is saying, listen, God is all of these things, and because God is all of these things, I know that when I'm in trouble, I'm going to call on the Lord, right? And if you look at these things that he has described God as being, we recognize how much we need these things in our own lives, don't we? He called God his rock. Sometimes it seems like the ground underneath us is constantly shifting like, like so much sand just going back and forth that there's no stability in life, right? That everything is constantly changing and nothing can be depended upon. God is a fortress. Well, we need a fortress. We need a place to take refuge. And sometimes we need deliverance as well. We need to have a shield and we need to have confidence in the fact that God is our horn. He is our power and our strength. He is our stronghold. He is our refuge. And because we know all of these things are true about him, then we can call upon him. When David does this, and by extension, when we do it, when we begin our prayer by extolling the virtues of God, when we begin our prayer by talking about the wonderful attributes of God and how worthy he is, what does that do to our confidence? It increases our confidence. God already knows he's all of these things. So when we say these things to him and about him, who are we reminding? We're reminding ourselves, right? We are reminding ourselves that God is a rock, that he's a fortress, that he's a deliverer, that he's a shield, a horn, a stronghold, a refuge. We're reminding ourselves of these things. And when we are reminded of these things, then we can say with David, I will call upon the Lord, right? 
when we face difficulties in life, when we face trials, when we feel as though everything around us is unstable and unsteady, when we feel as though we are under attack and we need a place of refuge and we need a place to hide, we need to follow the example of David and encourage ourselves in the Lord and then call upon his name. And what's more, we can encourage one another and remind one another of these things and call upon the Lord together. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Now David is going to give some examples. He says, when the waves of death surrounded me, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. So was David afraid? Yes. There were plenty of times in David's life when it was quite reasonable to be afraid. And may I say, it is quite reasonable for us to be afraid sometimes too because the circumstances that we face on a regular basis are more than we can bear. The circumstances that we find ourselves surrounded by threaten to overwhelm us. And apart from the strength that God provides, they would overwhelm us. And so to be afraid in a natural sense is very normal. And we need to recognize that, that it's okay to feel fear. Now, what we don't want to do is to surrender to fear. But when fear comes, what do we do? We remind ourselves of who God is, and then we call upon him and ask him to do what only he can do, right? Fear, however, is not the only emotion that we struggle with, nor was it the only emotion that David struggled with. Look at verse 6. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. So David was sorrowful. David was sad. David was distressed. You don't have to watch the news for very long to find things to be sorrowful and distressed about in our world today. You know, I remember... On July 3rd, thinking to myself, well, July 4th is around the corner. I'm sure something bad is going to happen on that day. And sure enough, it did. It's become so predictable, hasn't it? That these things are going to happen. It's not a question of if they're going to happen. It's a question of when and where, because they're going to. And it can be very overwhelming it can fill our hearts with sorrow, and it can even make us afraid. But sorrow and fear, though they are part of what we experience, cannot be allowed to define who we are. Because we, much like David, are children of the king. Amen? We are children of God. The sorrows of the grave, Sheol, surrounded David. The snares of death confronted him. In other words, there were dangers all around, right? For David, it wasn't a question of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. There were literally people trying to kill him, right? Have you ever heard the expression, just because you think that everyone's out to get you doesn't mean that they're not, right? David could say, yeah, my enemies abound. There are those who want my life. There are those who seek to slay me. And he wasn't exaggerating. He wasn't being paranoid. This was the reality of his experience. He was confronted with the snares or traps of death. And he was distressed by these things. It's not that these things didn't bother David. It's not that they didn't upset him. He was distressed by them. There's something that I've been thinking about for a long time, and um, I, I think at some point I'm going to act on this, but I want to write a book or a series on the subject of anxiety being our friend, and of anxiety being useful to us as believers. And the reason that I think that we could consider it our friend and the reason that I think that we could say that it is useful to us as believers is because of what Paul writes in Philippians, that we are to be anxious over nothing, but in all things through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to make our requests known to God. Amen. 
And so anxiety can be a trigger for prayer. Anxiety is an indicator in our lives that there is something we need to be praying about. And if we treat it as that, if we treat it as a tool rather than a torment, then we can move from being controlled by it to being in control of it. Does that make sense? So if you find yourself sorrowful, or if you find yourself afraid, or if you find yourself anxious, or if you find yourself in distress, then recognize that you feel that way for a reason. And that there are things going on in the world around you, in your life, that are more than you can handle by yourself. And that that is the time to do exactly as David does here in verse 7, and call upon the Lord, and cry out to my God. And here's what will happen. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry entered his ears. God heard when David cried out to him. And as we will see, if we were to read the rest of this chapter, God answered, right? So in our distress, let's follow David's example. In our distress, let's follow David's example and remind ourselves of who God is, remind ourselves of what God is like, remind ourselves of what God has done, acknowledge our emotions, don't deny the fact that we're fearful, don't deny the fact that we're anxious, don't deny the fact that we're in danger, don't deny the fact that we're in distress, but recognizing these things, let's purpose in our hearts to call out to the Lord with confidence, knowing that he will hear us from heaven and that he will indeed act on our behalf. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that when we're fearful, when we're distressed, that we can call out to you, for you are our fortress. You are our strong defense. You are our shield. You, Lord, are our strength. And our battles become your victories. For that we thank you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.